Good morning, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to our Mass. We want to pray for you, so please leave your intentions in the comments. And the intention for which this Mass is offered at the request of Jean Feldposch is for her deceased husband, Barry, who was a committed pro-life man, prayed outside abortion facilities, rain or shine. So together we commend him to the Lord today. This is the feast of St. Ambrose, bishop and doctor of the church. In the midst of the church he opened his mouth, and the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and clothed him in a robe of glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. Let us turn to the Lord and ask him to take away all our sins. Lord Jesus, victor over death, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus, giver of life, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, coming in glory, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who made the bishop St. Ambrose a teacher of the Catholic faith and a model of apostolic courage, raise up in your church men after your own heart to govern her with courage and wisdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end, her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the desert prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rugged land shall be made a plain. The rough country a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries. A voice says, cry out. I answer, what shall I cry out? All flesh is grass, and all their glory like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower wilts, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. So then the people is the grass. Though the grass withers and the flower wilts, the word of our God stands forever. Go up onto a high mountain, Zion, herald of glad tidings. Cry out at the top of your voice, Jerusalem, herald of good news. Fear not to cry out, and say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Here comes with power the Lord God, who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd he feeds his flock, in his arms he gathers the lambs, carrying them in his bosom, and leading the ewes with care. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord our God comes with power. The Lord our God comes with power. Sing to the Lord a new song. 
Sing to the Lord, all you lands. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Announce His salvation day after day. The Lord, our God, comes with power. Tell His glory among the nations, among all peoples His wondrous deeds. Say among the nations, the Lord is King. He governs the peoples with equity. The Lord, our God, comes with power. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and what fills it resound. Let the plains be joyful and all that is in them. Then let all the trees of the forest rejoice. The Lord our God comes with power. They shall exult before the Lord, for He comes, for He comes to rule the earth. He shall rule the world with justice and the peoples with His constancy. The Lord our God comes with power. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? And if he finds it, amen, I say to you, he rejoices more over it then over the ninety-nine that did not stray. In just the same way, it is not the will of your heavenly Father that one of these little ones be lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. These readings and this feast go together well. The readings are Advent readings. The feast is that of one of the four great doctors of the Latin Church, together with St. Augustine, whom he baptized, and with St. Gregory the I and, and St. Jerome. We have today St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, 4th century. And he's a doctor of the Church. His teachings are and prayers and hymns are used to this day in the church throughout the world and he's a shepherd as the prophecy of Isaiah says the Savior will be he will shepherd his people like a shepherd he feeds his flock feeds them with the teaching and also feeds them with the guidance the moral guidance being a light to the people as to what is right, what is wrong, and when someone is not responding to the teaching, utilizing where necessary discipline. Discipline to guide them the right way. Ambrose did that because he was inspired with what the Lord proclaimed here in the Gospel, that if one is lost or is in danger of being lost. You pay attention to that person. You don't let them set the agenda. Oh, I'm not interested in the things of the faith, the church, or God. You don't just say, well, okay, he's not interested, let him go. You go after the lost sheep. Oh, I'm no longer interested, leave me alone. It's because we care for them and love them that we don't leave them alone. We attempt to reconcile them. We at least make sure that they have heard the urgent invitation to reconciliation. Ambrose did that with the emperor, Theodosius. What happened was, in Thessalonica, there was a massacre of some 7,000 people, and Theodosius was in some way responsible for that. Ambrose came to know of it, and... Uh, and admonished him. The emperor realized pretty quickly that it was a bad thing. In fact, he tried to stop it, but it was too late. He had already failed to prevent it. So he was responsible. And Ambrose told him that. The emperor tried to go back to the cathedral. The bishop intercepted him and wouldn't let him in. Theodoret relates this little 
fact of history and says, Ambrose prevented his entrance, saying, You do not reflect, it seems, O Emperor, on the guilt you have incurred by that great massacre. But now that your fury is appeased, do you not perceive the enormity of your crime? You must not be dazzled by the splendor of the purple you wear and be led to forget the weakness of the body which it clothes. Your subjects, O Emperor, are of the same nature as yourself, and not only so, but are likewise your fellow servants. For there is one Lord and ruler of all, and he is the maker of all creatures, whether princes or people. How would you look upon the temple of the, Lord, the one Lord of all? How can you lift up in prayer hands steeped in the blood of so unjust a massacre? Depart then, and do not by a second crime add to the guilt of the first. That's a shepherd. That's one going in search of the lost. He reflects there the words of the first chapter of Isaiah the prophet, where God says, I will not even listen to your prayers because your hands are full of blood. And Jesus says, if you realize when you come to offer your gift at the altar that your brother has something against you, he said, first go back and be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. This whole dispute about who should receive communion, this is answered a long time ago in Scripture and in history. If we have blood on our hands, it's not that God is rejecting us forever or the church just doesn't want us to be part of her worship. No, it's that the church wants to reconcile us, purify us, change us, help us to love. Ambrose wrote a letter to the emperor. Let me quote from some of it here. First of all, Ambrose was not silent about this. Some church leaders attempted to be silent about the complicity of civic leaders in the massacre of innocent people. Ambrose says, Was I to hold my tongue? That would have been the most miserable course of all, for my conscience would have been fettered, my voice silenced. And what about the text stating that if the priest will not admonish the wrongdoer, the wrongdoer will die in his guilt. But the priest will be liable to punishment because he did not warn the wrongdoer. Again, referring to the prophecy, this time of Ezekiel. By the way, the U.S. bishops wrote beautifully about this in their 1998 document, Living the Gospel of Life. And they said, we bishops must speak. The recent document on the Eucharist said the same thing, that bishops bear a special responsibility to address the situations where public officials depart from the moral law. Well, here you had a sample of that back in the 4th century. St. Ambrose and the Emperor Theodosius. Ambrose continues to write, An act was committed at Thessalonica which is unprecedented in human memory, an act whose perpetration I could not prevent, an act which previously I warned in so many petitions I had warned would be an atrocity, an act which you yourself condemned as brutal when you revoked it, too late. That act I could not extenuate. He goes on, I have written these things not to embarrass you, but so that these examples involving kings may induce you to lift this burden of sin from your kingship. Notice now, with a shepherd's heart, going in search of the lost, he's asking him to repent. Publicly asking him to repent. You will lift it by humbling your soul before God. You are a man, and temptation has come your way. Conquer it. Sin cannot be abolished otherwise than by tears and penitence. And then he addresses a little later in the letter the matter of communion and mass. St. Ambrose, whom we celebrate today, whom bishops will be celebrating and honoring in their cathedrals all over the world today. I wonder how much they will think about reread or quote from this letter. Ambrose says, I have reason to be afraid on your behalf. Now listen to what he says about the sacrifice of the Mass. He, the bishop, says, I dare not offer the sacrifice if you intend to be there. Let me reread that again. Because this is based, again, on the biblical teaching. 
I dare not offer the sacrifice if you intend to be there. Or is what is not allowed when the blood of one innocent victim has been shed allowed when the blood has been shed of many? I do not think so. You undoubtedly wish to be approved of by God. There is a time for everything as it is written. Lord, there is a time for doing and a time for being accepted. You will make your offering then, the bishop is telling the emperor, when you have received permission to sacrifice, when your offering has become acceptable to God. Ambrose wasn't doing this for any political purpose. He was doing this because if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? Fortunately, the emperor Theodosius did repent. It was a time, an eight-month period of penance. He did not participate in the sacrifice. And Ambrose told him that he had to change public policy to make the kind of event that happened in Thessalonica, that massacre of 7,000 people, less likely to happen, happen in the future. And he did. The emperor followed the guidance from Bishop Ambrose, and he did. And then he was admitted back to communion on Christmas. You know the gospel passage here about the welcoming back of the strayed sheep is not only a lesson to the shepherd, it's a lesson to the rest of the sheep who have not strayed because we are to rejoice in the one who comes back when and if they do come back because not all of them do. But remember when God was angry at the prophet Jonah because Jonah was angry that Nineveh, to whom God sent him to preach repentance, actually repented. God said, don't be sad about that. Don't be angry about that. Rejoice with me in that. The prodigal son, the other son who was there at home faithfully all the time, became indignant that the prodigal son was welcomed back and treated well. And a party was held. And the father said, rejoice that the lost have come back. The gospel parable of the men hired at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and they ended up getting the same daily wage got the others who worked all day angry. And Jesus said, no, you don't be angry at that. When the nations, when the Gentiles are welcomed into God's kingdom, even though the faithful have been there all the time, those of Jewish descent who remained faithful, God says, don't be angry at that. Rejoice that the love of God is conquering evil and the maker of all is welcoming back what is his own. And so we are to rejoice too. We who are priests and people who are faithful and staying with the church all the time should not look down on people who are only connecting with the church once in a while, at Christmas, on Palm Sunday, on Easter Sunday, at weddings and at funerals, especially on all those occasions. People will come into the doors of our church who don't go there regularly, and they don't have much attachment to the church. Maybe they don't have much faith, but we're not to despise them. We're not to look down on them. We're not to call them hypocrites. We're not to say, oh, you don't belong here. Go away. No, it's just the opposite. We're to open our arms wide and say, of course you belong here. Welcome to your home. We want to see you more. Be good to those who connect with the church just a little bit. Be good to them. And let them feel that they are welcome there every day. And that if they come, they will find people who love them. And people who are not afraid to tell them what it is that they are coming to. This false, destructive, 
watered down, backwards and upside down notion that too many have, that we can just welcome people in without giving them any standards to live up to, and that discipline is never appropriate, what a disservice that is to the very people they claim to be serving. We have to clearly call people to union with the living Christ in his body, the church. That means something. We can understand what that meaning is. Following the commandments is clear because the commandments themselves are clear. There's no room here for questioning what is it that we really believe, what is our identity, what's the right path that we have to live. Make straight the way of the Lord, the reading says in Isaiah today. We can make it straight because we know what direction it goes. And we know the difference between right and wrong. Thank you, Lord, for welcoming, welcoming us back from the wrong that we do. Thank you, Lord, for welcoming back all your people to whom we loudly proclaim the Lord is coming. Prepare his way. Amen.